Thank you, Clement. All day we lay our future in thy hand. United free for liberty together we'll always stand. Thank you, Duncan. We are now going to sing the UCU anthem. To God be the glory. Great things we have done, so loving the one that he gave us his son. Who gave his life and has gone for sin and opened the life gates. First of all, to welcome everyone to this special policy lab of the Africa Policy Center. As you know, those of you that have been with us and followed, we have a regular series of these labs every week, beginning, uh, I think this is number four, correct? And they're typically on Thursday afternoons from four to seven. I invite you to the one uh, that will be held next week at the regular time. I'm happy to be with, here with you again. I was here last week and was uh, attending, uh, participating in the other two uh, digitally from over 10,000 kilometers away at home. And this wonderful technology makes it possible for that to happen. So I think there are probably others who might be streaming this, either live at this time or will be watching it at another time. We really have taken a step up this year by using this technology that's available now at Uganda Christian University. So welcome to this policy lab. We at Africa Policy Center are dedicated to examining our public responsibilities through the policy making process and through many other avenues to influence, to help shape, to be responsible in the world that we live in and to bring godliness to all sectors of life to the extent that God enables us to do so. And we're a small think tank here that is uh, researching, 
working, uh, advancing in many ways um, what we hope is God's agenda in the world that we that's uh, why we're here together. Uh, let me obey some of the protocols, <laughs> which I neglected to do last week. I committed the gr most grievous error of all when I stood up last week and neglected to introduce my lovely wife, Elizabeth, who's with me on this trip. So I have to correct that error and uh, ask you to forgive me and also to welcome her. Um, we're graced by the presence of our grandfather to APC, Professor Peter Obamba Joshua, Director of Research here at the university. So please welcome Professor Peter. Thank you for coming. And a special friend is with us here tonight. Uh, his lovely wife is not with him, but she's around, <laughs> so you'll probably see them together. But Mr. Jack Clink from the United States is a longtime friend of Uganda, having come here first as a very, not that way. Uh, he's somebody you ought to get to know because he knows the history of Uganda like this man does, <laughs> these two, in the way that none of the rest of us do. He's a member of the board of Uganda Christian University Partners, which is an organization based in the U.S., also with a branch in the U.K., that gives support body that the VC and other leaders of UCU pay, pay a lot of attention to and, and visit uh, with us. I, I'm also a member of that board, uh, and uh, we, we meet once a year in the United States and do other things for the support of Uganda Christian University generally. Jack is also a great friend and supporter of Africa Policy Center. He told me once that he'd been dreaming of a Christian think tank in Uganda for decades, <laughs> long before any of us ever thought about it. So uh, we really owe him a special debt of gratitude for the support of what we're doing today and all of the things that Africa Policy Center. That having been done, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for bringing us here together in your name to do your work. Remind us that everything in this world is loved for you, cared by you, and is being redeemed by you, being brought back to you. Even as we seek to live together in community and work out laws and policies and practices that we need in order to live together as a society, as a nation, help us to be a part of the process of enabling this nation and others to bring glory to you in all that you say and do. Uh, for God in my country is this motto and help us always to remember that and always to God give all the glory as we sing today. We pray for this meeting, we pray for understand better the things that are being put before us. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Now I've spent a few minutes today, uh, wasn't, it was a bit unplanned, but it's worked out well that I've been able to get to know him just a bit. We weren't acquainted before today, but it's been a wonderful day uh, of, in my case, listening, sitting at his feet, <laughs> learning from of uh, world history, <laughs> of uh, the development of the church, the uh, place of nations, in the world that we live in and all the challenges that are coming from the undermining of godly ways, not only in Western society, which we often hear so much about, but even in places like Uganda and elsewhere. So we have much to learn from him all week. As you know, he is the public lecturer for uh, the Friday. He will be making other presentations throughout the week that some of which you're able to attend tomorrow midday. He was born in Chattapur, India. Uh, he uh, has been jailed and persecuted for some of the work that he's done uh, in one organization called the Association for Comprehensive Rural Assistance. Also has a master's degree in theology from Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, USA. Uh, I could read the whole thing, but I think you'll find this uh, posted elsewhere. He has a number of publications to his name. One early book that caught my attention is called Truth and Social Reform, which I would love to hear more about. And I actually invited him to lecture on that today, but he chose today's topic instead, <laughs> which I think means it's fresher and more pertinent to what um, uh, he wants to bring to our attention this week. Some of his more recent works, The Open Wounds of Islam, he's explored how uh, the Christian faith interacts with and deals with both Islam and Hinduism at other times, he has very deep insights into the way in which nations develop politically 
And perhaps we'll hear more about some of the things that he shared with us earlier about deep concerns that he has for the way uh, the political situation is developing in his own country, India, uh, as well as transferring those insights to places like Uganda and elsewhere. Uh, today, he's asked to address us on this topic, trends in gender policy, sexuality, and family. Uh, I think when I first put that before him, I said global trends. Somehow the global got dropped, but we'll see how he handles it. And he's uh, expressed the Indian perspective, but I can tell you he's a world Christian. He's been everywhere. <laughs> he's traveled. He's uh, thought and interacted with so many others. Uh, he was discussing with us earlier uh, because we were saying that one of the purposes of APC is not only to research, but to do applied research, research that is applicable in the public square. And he gave us the uh, name of what he calls applied theology. And I think that's the way, the realm in which, which he works. So let me ask you to give a warm welcome to our speaker today, Vishal Mangalvan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that warm welcome and introduction. Uh, my wife has an MA in theology from Wheaton, not me. Oh, okay, excuse uh, me. <laughs> but I married her so that my theology might be checked and corrected. Uh, she is an Indian from North India. Uh, it is actually global trends in gender policy. Uh, so, because Africa is being invaded from the West and there is a war for the soul of Africa. Or there will be many policy issues which will not be about the soul of Africa, but this is about the soul of a nation of Africa because uh, ruled in England that a Christian doctor, David McCarrath, was dismissed from national health services. In England, they, had, they have a national health services. He was assigned to the Department of Works and Pensions. So people who need pensions for whatever reason come to him for medical assessment. And a gentleman, six feet tall, bearded, came to him and demanded the Dr. David call him Madam. So uh, the doctor said that I've been working in this field as a physician for 30 years, a gentleman, a madam. The patient took it as an insult, filed a case against the doctor, and the National Health Services fired him, dismissed him from, he lost his job. He appealed, uh, this happened in July, the appeal was rejected, and in fact the judge ruled that the doctor has testified that it is his biblical conscience, his conscience shaped by the Bible, that would not allow him to call a man a madam. So the judge ruled that his biblical faith is incompatible with human dignity. He's violating the dignity of this woman, who is a transgender, in her mind, his mind, and he, the doctor, ought to respect it. And the modern policy of transgenderism must supersede his biblical prejudices, biases, vocabulary, worldview, uh, etc. Now, this is a uh, British case, but it has di direct bearing on Uganda. A, one of the professors in Uganda was engaged by a UN-related agency to write a course on teaching Ugandan students uh, respect for the confused Western genderism, uh, LGBTQ, the lesbians and gays and bisexuals, transgenders, queer, etc. that how to teach Ugandan students. So she said, uh, I'm afraid that this will not be accepted in Uganda, but I can certainly write a curriculum uh, to teach students to respect 
uh, to love their neighbors who are confused about their sexual identity. So there are lots of people who are genuinely confused about their sexual identity, whether for biological reasons or psychological reasons or cultural reasons. And um, God loves them and therefore we must teach our people to love and respect uh, those you might disagree with very strongly, uh, but you love the person, not their ideas, not their vocabulary, not their worldview necessarily. So uh, she was hired and asked to submit a, a proposal, including the budget, of what would it cost to create the curriculum, translate the curriculum, and uh, promote the curriculum throughout Uganda. She submitted a budget of 8,000 US dollars and this African officer of UN uh, related agency, she said that this is, looks very good. Uh, we have a deal, but just inflate the budget to 20,000 uh, 20, US dollars. Uh, you will get your 8,000, I will get 12,000. You do the work. Who, people who believe, don't believe in dualism of male and female, they don't believe in dualism of good and evil. Yeah, I'm not doing any work, but I'm giving you 8,000, you give me 12. So here are international forces that have rejected not only the Bible's idea of male and female, but the Bible's idea of good and evil, who are seeking to use educational machinery of the state to capture the soul and bring all of their confusion or their corruption into Africa. So this is global African trends in gender policy, sexuality and family seen through Indian eyes. Why? Uh, because the West is confused today heading into the darkness but that confusion comes from India, as I will show in a few minutes. Uh, so the source of current sexual confusion is Carl Jung, uh, the psychoanalyst from Basel, follower of Freud, Sigmund Freud, who came to India in the winter of 1936-37. And uh, that is the beginning. He's the grandfather of the New Age movement, uh, which is the real source of the intellectual confusion. So when we are looking at a policy issue, uh, we are looking at it philosophically, theologically, uh, and its practical implications. What is this battle all about? Uh, you are seeking to build Uganda as a great nation uh, to have the nation seek truth, to be built upon truth. And, uh, uh, that's what we are looking at. So quite a bit of the discussion would be philosophical, some of it technological, uh, and uh, uh, it will be you have to shape the policy or fight specific policy battle based with that understanding of a holistic, integrated perspective on the issues of gender and sexuality and family. So we will not be able to finish everything today. Some of it will continue in the discussion of parenting in crisis in the public lecture on Wednesday. Uh, <clears throat> but what exactly is happening to a per person who is biologically male, but he demands that he should be addressed as a female because he feels he is a woman? So what's happening? What is maleness? What is femaleness? Uh, this is uh, the question. Now, I'd like to use a very sim a simple analogy to help you understand the philosophical depths of the problem. It's a profound problem uh, which also originates with Buddhism, but right now it is sweeping Europe and increasingly America. Uh, the question is raised in Psalm 8 verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? 
you've created all of this wonderful universe with stars and galaxies and constellations, but you're mindful of him, you care for him. You have placed everything under his feet and authority. You've made man ruler over everything that you, you have created. That's the could have said that you love man so much that you sent your son to shed his blood for this man. What is man that you care so much for him that you will send your son to die for these sinful rebels, confused, lost people? So man is very important. So the phrase dignity of man which the uh, British court used uh, in firing a man who is seeking to live by his conscience according to the biblical view that God made man in his image, male and female. Uh, the court said that his biblical perspective violates the dignity of human beings. Uh, but in fact, the phrase dignity, uh, the word dignity, comes from the Latin translation of that psalm Psalm 8, that you have bestowed upon him dignitas, honor, glory, dignity. God has bestowed upon him. Uh, other than that, there really is no foundation for human dignity, as we will see in a few minutes. So let's begin with a simple illustration, because what I want to give you a short course in Western philosophy and Indian philosophy, which is at the root of the confusion, darkness, lostness. So imagine in London, you have a, a very senior officer in a company. He has had a very nasty divorce. Because as you know, that human intellect is simply incapable of keeping two lovers together. The French revolutionaries didn't think so. The whole of the Enlightenment didn't think so. They trusted human reason. But now everybody knows that human intellect is incapable of keeping two lovers together, let alone keeping a nation together such as England. It's already splintered into many, their parliamentarians is splintered. Parties are irrelevant ideas and to many groups. And in human intellect is incapable of keeping Democrats and Republicans together in America. America is at, a, at an intellectual civil war. When it will translate into actual war and become like Uganda, we don't know. You've had nine elections uh, since 1962. Not, not nine elections, nine changes of power, transition of power. Not a single one of them peaceful. Everyone through coup, through violence, and America is getting there, you're just ahead of America. But uh, for now, uh, the uh, confidence that human mind can keep two lovers together has, is being shown that the secular marriage, even when it is marriage of two believers, two Christians, two evangelicals, it doesn't actually work. Because marriage is not uh, evolutionary idea. It's not a biological idea. It's a supernatural idea and it takes supernatural grace, humility, repentance, forgiveness uh, to, for its survival. If you lean only on your own understanding, you can't su survive. You have to ask for wisdom from above. Anyway, so this gentleman has had a terrible divorce and then after several years, he begins to date another woman who really loves him, likes him, and he's attracted to her, and he gets married again. And then, a few months later, they start fighting and have another terrible divorce. So he is a Chinese female, because the Chinese are manufacturing really good Roxies. Because they can produce one just to suit exactly what kind of hairstyle and eyelashes and um, body and skin color and size that you want so they can tailor make a female just for you. So he orders one and he decides this time I'm not going to go for formal marriage because uh, legally it's not required that I sign uh, have a wedding ceremony with my uh, new life partner. So I will actually have a small party at home Friday evening, invite a few friends 
and since he doesn't have a wife, uh, food will have to be ordered from outside. So a caterer will come and set up the food while all his friends, all men, uh, come after work to celebrate his third marriage. Well, as everybody is on their way, he gets a phone call from his boss that a mega multi-million dollar project, a multi-million pound project has just come from China. I need you in the office because this cannot wait for the weekend. So please turn back, come, we should make a decision. So he has to turn around and he calls his friends and tell him that I'm sorry, uh, I have to go. But the food is there, wine is there, please go in, uh, have a party, I won't be with you. So now on his own wedding night, he has to turn around and work. And it becomes very clear that he will not be back home with, before midnight. So he uh, the, tells them, sorry, you guys lock the house and go. So uh, while they are eating and drinking and they get a little bit too drunk, uh, they decide that since the bridegroom hasn't come, let's at least look at the bride. So they open the box and she is beautiful, stunning. Without clothes, of course, but clothes are there. She is very beautiful. And they decide to turn her on because the batteries are fully charged. And uh, she begins to talk and she is extremely seductive, better than any wife, and uh, attractive. So they said, well, we might as well initiate her. Why should she have to be left alone because the boss has uh, taken hold of her husband? So they go ahead and initiate her. The question, can she sue them, file a police case that she has been raped? Is she raped? Because they haven't bought her they are not married to her. Uh, have they violated her dignity? You're policy makers. What do you think? No. Why not? Because she's not a natural human being. Sorry? Because she's not a natural human being. She's not a natural human being. So. Uh, the word natural is the important one. She is an artificial human being. Well, uh, she has artificial intelligence today. She can play chess and beat you. She can translate hundreds of languages. She has entire Wikipedia. So any question you ask, she can tell you. Uh, she can pass any exam with, you, with this mathematics person, a human being, a soul or self. And you are saying she is not. Well, Saudi Arabia happens to be the first most, there's a bill pending in European Parliament right now uh, that robots should be recognized as persons. Yes, today she has artificial intelligence. But what if 100 years from now she has biointelligence? Is she a person? So what God created is person, what man creates is not. That, but every university in America, England, all over the world is saying that God never created human beings. We evolved in the northern jungles of Uganda from the apes who are still there. That's what they are teaching. Ugandans may not believe that, but uh, everybody thinks Uganda is where all of us came from. So uh, the question, what is a person? You are saying that God breathed his breath, his soul, his spirit into Adam and he became a living soul. He is a person made in God's own likeness. 
The machine can be very sophisticated, can do things, uh, run much faster than I can and have a lot more strength than I do. But uh, just because they are faster, stronger, can solve mathematical problems much faster and much bigger problems. Um, a machine is, you are saying, is not a person because machines produce, we create. There's a choice involved. And we create what we choose to create. Even photography is a creative art. That photographer is making a decision about the angle, the light, the size, etc. So we are creative creatures made in the image of the creator. Machines are productive creation. They can produce things much better, much faster, much neater than we can. But uh, machines are not made in the creator's image as a living soul. Now this is a philosophical, uh, theological perspective which is informing your um, policy. You're in a government, you're making policy decisions about what will our children study, students study, about gender and family, sexuality, etc. And, uh, but as a policy maker, you are bringing your theology, as are they. So let's pursue this a little bit more. Suppose Roxy looks like a woman, talks like a woman, she has all the female organs, but you take her feminine chip out of her memory and insert a masculine chip. She begins to talk like a man, say I'm man, I'm Roxwell, not Roxy and uh, etc. So is she a male or a female? Now that she's in all her conversation, I believe, her talk, she is talking as a male. Is she a female or a male? Body is female, but she, whatever that means, or it, is she a male or a female? Sorry? She's transgender. So suppose, suppose you remove the masculine chip and insert a cat chip. Now she's a cat woman. She meows like a cat, she scratches like a cat, she bites like a cat and she wants to be purred like a cat, etc. Um, so is she a, a human being or a cat? Uh, she becomes a cat because uh, I think we are because of the content, not the shape or the frame. Okay, so someone created the chip and implanted it in your body and your culture your parents, your teachers, your friends, they implanted a male chip in your brain. So you talk of yourself as a male, talk of yourself as a female, um, feel as a male. That your maleness and femaleness is a cultural con construct, a linguistic construct. That is in fact what postmodern philosophers, Jacques Derrida, uh, Michel Foucault, etc. They are saying that your gender identity is a linguistic construct, but in fact they are going much deeper that your idea of self, personhood, that you are not a machine, you are a person, you are not a robot, which the robot does not have. That's what you are saying. Now that's a philosophical idea. Can you prove that you are a person, a self, a soul. What is soul?
So the heart of the problem of the darkness and confusion of the West is not gender. Is it male or a female? The confusion is much deeper, metaphysical, philosophical. Is a human being a person, a self, a soul, a permanent entity, an immortal entity, valuable, with dignity? Where does this idea of dignity come from? Universities, McCrary University, everybody else. It begins with Rene Descartes. Uh, rationalist philosophy, the age of reason. The phrase was coined by Thomas Paine later, but the reality was born with Descartes' uh, dictum. Descartes says, I doubt that God exists. The sage enlightenment thinker thinks that the world is an illusion. I doubt that you exist. Actually, I'm in bed dreaming. So you don't really exist except in my dream. I doubt that I exist. Is that possible? Is it logical? No. The first three or four are logical statements. I doubt God exists, world exists, you exist. But when I say I doubt that I exist, Descartes says that is contradiction in terms. That cannot be true. My skepticism cannot be true at that point because when I say I doubt ex I exist, I am thinking that I may not exist. I am thinking means that I exist. So his first dictum is, I think therefore I am. I think therefore I am. The philosophers who follow him, such as uh, Scottish philosopher David Hume, he says, wait a minute, no, no, no. You think you're being rigorous mathematical in your philosophy and logic, but actually you're quite confused. You have made a basic logical fallacy. What you have proven is that doubt exists, thinking exists. You've not proven that the doubter, the thinker exists, because in order to prove that the thinker, you, the self, the soul, exists, you have to first prove causation, right? That every effect has to have a cause. So I'm doubting that fact of doubting has to have a cause, a doubter, a thinker. You have to first prove causation for your logic to be complete, but there is no way human logic can prove causation. Why? Very simple. An atheist has to believe that the universe has always existed. Or, once upon a time, the universe didn't exist. There was no God, no soul, no spirit, no angels, no demons, no energy, no matter. Out of a big bang, for no reason, uh, no cause, the whole universe came into existence. So if the universe can exist without a cause, either as an eternal entity or as an entity that begins with a big bang, if the universe can exist without a cause, why can't thinking exist without a cause? Why can't doubting exist without a cause? So. Uh, Yes, doubting it proves is that doubting exists, not that the doubter exists as a soul, as a self, as a person, as an immortal, precious entity. All knowledge, Hume says, comes to us through our eyes and ears and nose and touch and smell and taste. Uh, that's called empiricism, that empirical experiences uh, give us the information that the brain processes and turns into knowledge. But unfortunately, I cannot see your soul and I cannot touch your soul and I cannot hear your soul and I cannot smell or taste <coughs> your soul. So I have no empirical way of knowing that you exist as a soul. I can touch a no Roxy and I can touch you. Uh, 
Uh, body exists, yes. Matter exists, physics and chemistry exist. But the soul exists, can neither be proven through logic nor through empirical experience. So Western philosophers tried for centuries to get away from this dilemma that how do you know that you exist as a soul? What makes you different from a Roxy? That you are a permanent, precious, immortal soul. How do I know that? I have no way of knowing it. So, now this is extremely important as you participate in policy decisions because those UN officers are interested in $12,000. Let the culture go to hell. Uh, they are not really interested in truth. They are being bullied by the devil because there really is an evil supernatural force uh, that wants to rule this world. Why is it that Uganda cannot have a civilized transition of power? That you cannot have political and bureaucratic leadership which is corruption free. But this is because a devil really exists and he re really wants to rule this world. Evil exists. You experience it. How to fight it is part of what the, your policy institute is all about, but we are sticking with the gender confusion and its relationship to sexuality and family uh, because when we come to Wednesday talking about parenting, uh, why is abortion something for which 12 presidential candidates in America today will fight for? including women, Elizabeth Warren or um, Kamala Harris or others, that we must defend the right to abort babies because the baby has no soul. Even after the baby is born. What is soul? If your soul, yourself, is a cultural linguistic construct, then the child has not yet developed an identity of self. That is why if you can kill a chicken and sell chicken part, and you are in Uganda, so you are safe, you can even kill cows and sell cow meat and cow parts. Why just abort a baby? Why not cut up the baby and sell baby's body parts? A lot of people will buy it, including within America. All the research labs will buy the baby parts. So abortion clinics, Planned Parenthood, were doing that until a few months ago when they were exposed and there was a big hue and cry. How could they degenerate to that point? Because their philosophical worldview is very different than yours. They actually believe that there, no child is born as a human person. Personhood is the chip, male chip or female chip or cat chip, that language creates. Your parents create, your physician, your class teachers, your friends. They create the chip that is implanted and you accept. But why do you allow your parents and doctors and teachers to define who you are, whether you are a male or a female? Why should others define it? Why shouldn't you assert your right to define whether I'm a male or a female? That's the issue, right? You don't actually exist, but you must define yourself. So, as we begin to analyze, and you will have these fierce discussions as you become 
part of uh, policy making teams, whether from bureaucratic angle or intellectual angle or political angle, when you are discussing that Satan wants to have the soul of Uganda and you are having to fight for God's will to be done in Uganda, uh, you have to understand that your opponents have been brainwashed by universities controlled by the devil. The highest, the best universities, much better funded and with much better teachers. But whether, however, the devil has taken control of those universities that you don't exist. You are an artificial construct of language, of culture. And you have the freedom to take control of your own life and say, no, no, no. Until yesterday I was a female, from today I'm going to be male. Because I'm going to define who I am. I'm going to change the language and all the rules. Well, okay. This is exactly what the Buddha was teaching. Gautam Buddha, the Indian sage. This is where the Indian perspective becomes important. The main difference between Hinduism and Buddhism is that Hinduism said that spiritual realm, self, a soul, exists. Buddhism said self doesn't exist, soul doesn't exist. Body exists, yes, but there is no soul in Roxy. Therefore, Hinduism, uh, uh, particularly Buddhism right now, I'll come back to Hinduism if time permits, or if it doesn't permit, then you can discuss it uh, during tea time. Uh, let's stick to Buddhism for now, that'll be simpler. Um, if soul does not actually exist, then there is no you. Therefore, Buddhism never discussed the issues of human rights and human dignity. These discussions, human rights, human dignity, human conscience, human freedom, all of these are part of Western philosophy, political thought, in as much as the West is debating biblical ideas, Western philosophy has to interact with the Bible because the church is so powerful, present everywhere. So you have to interact with uh, the idea. So Descartes is saying, I exist as a soul, even if logically he hasn't proven that he exists. But intuitively he knows he exists. But what is intuition? I thought truth was logical, not intuitive. My wife and I have been married for 43 years, and that simply means that we've had plenty of time to fight. <laughs> and when we have a very big fight, it goes on for a few days, few weeks, I give her six reasons why I'm right and she's wrong. And her ultimate response is that, look, I, don't know, I can't argue with you because you're a better debater, but I know you're wrong. <laughs> it takes me 10 years to realize she was actually right. And then I can give half a dozen reasons why she was right and I was wrong. She still can't give any reason. She does have an MA uh, in, from Wheaton. So if she worked hard, she could come up with reasons. But why bother working hard when you know you're right? Well, my brain is hardwired, the left brain, to think mathematically, logically, evidence. Her brain is hardwired to be intuitive, imaginative. Why should my logic have superiority over her intuition? The problem is that sometimes my logic is wrong, sometimes her intuition is wrong, and sometimes we are both wrong at the same time. And then we need our six-year-old granddaughter to tell us what is right. You can have an insight. But what is that insight? What is imagination? What is intuition? This takes the whole discussion to the realm of spirit. So I mentioned at the outset that the current gender confusion in America, uh, in the globally, comes uh, from India. 
And it begins with Carl Jung's visit to India in the winter of 1936-37. Jung is a follower of Nietzsche. Nietzsche, the German philosopher who declared God is dead, Western philosophy has killed God. Nietzsche is building, I mean, Freud, uh, Freud is psychoanal the father of psychoanalysis in Vienna, um, uh, which is in Austria. And he is building his psychology, uh, psycholo worldview of psychology, on Nietzsche's atheism. Atheism means, atheism doesn't mean God doesn't exist. Atheism means you don't exist. Because if God doesn't exist as a spirit, as a spiritual being, so you can't exist as a spirit. You are just a bio-robot, right? If God doesn't exist as a spiritual entity, you don't exist. You can't exist. And Nietzsche and all the atheists understood that, that it is not that God is dead. It is man is dead. There is no human being. Yes, Roxy is there, but she could become Roxwell, or she can become a cat woman, or whatever. So, uh, Freud is building his, his psychoanalysis analysis on an atheistic worldview. What that means is very simple. It means that a family is bringing a patient to Freud, that this person has gone insane, and we think he or she is demon-possessed. Please do something to help her. So Freud obviously doesn't believe in demon possession because there is no God, there can't be any spirits. So what's wrong with this patient? Well, the, what is wrong is that when she was a little girl, she had a crush on her father, but the father was sleeping with the mother, so she had to repress her sexuality. Then she had a crush on her teacher, on her uncle, on her brother, uh, but all of that had to be repressed. And this repression of sexuality had created psychosomatic problems, which we call demon possession. So demon possession is a biblical uh, interpretation of a psychological disorder, which is actually rooted in sexual repression. That is the background of the sexual revolution that uh, students should not have separate dormitory for men and women. They should be able to live in the same dorms. And sex should not be repressed, but should be expressed. And then everybody would be healthy. Except that the families will be dead, but individuals will be healthy. But so down with family anyway, uh, because it ends up in divorce in any case. So uh, you have, uh, this is what uh, Freud is building his uh, worldview, his uh, understanding of psychology, which is behind the Kinsey Report, which is behind uh, the Hugh Hefner Playboy Revolution. Playboy uh, Revolution by Hugh Hefner is the force that has destroyed biblical sexual ethic, biblical view of marriage, and created today's um, return to pagan Roman uh, Hindu sexuality in the West, which is really the war uh, against the uh, biblical view of sexuality, family, gender, etc., uh, that we are outlining. And some of it we may have to pursue during discussion uh, because um, I really want to help us understand what is it that Carl uh, Jung is seeing in India and how is he. Uh, taking the darkness from India into Basel and through there spreading all over the Western world, which is now coming and attacking you. Now, so Jung is Freud's prime disciple. He's the heir apparent of the psychoanalytic movement. Freud says to Jung, please, as you're going to be my successor, Promise me that you will never give up sexual repression theory. This is the foundation uh, of our whole system. Uh, so promise me that you will never give up this theory of sexual repression. Jung says, sir, the patient who was here in your, uh, on your couch today, 
do we really have hard scientific data that her sickness is caused by sexual repression? Are, are you imposing your theory upon her in explaining? Family says this person is demon possessed. You don't believe in spirits. You don't believe in demon. Do we have hard scientific data? And Freud is honest. No, we don't have hard scientific data. But we have to teach our theory as scientific dogma, as a bulwark. Bulwark against what? Bulwark against occult, against religion. Because it is religion that is saying that uh, this woman is demon possessed. That's a religious interpretation because the religion takes demons to be real. But uh, in fact, we know that there are no demons. So there has to be an alternative scientific expression. So Roxy gets confused and gets mentally sick. But we won't go there. So uh, let, let's uh, say that once Jung realizes that Freud is imposing upon the scientific world, therapy, therapy world, a worldview which is a belief is not resting on solid scientific evidence. Jung says that actually Freud is occult. He is promoting a theory for which he has no proof. So they part company. Freud be uh, Jung begins to explore the realm of spirit self. His father was a minister, uh, but he decides to look at how other cultures, who were not influenced by the Bible, how they have understood these problems of human self. What is man? What is soul? What is spirit? What is person? What is self? And he goes to India because Hinduism had developed uh, very sophisticated philosophies that everything is God, Brahma. There is a universal. Freud has talked about personal unconscious, conscious and uncon subconscious mind. Uh, Jung takes it further down to collective unconsciousness. We actually all have one soul. There is only one soul. This is the ocean, infinite ocean of consciousness. We are all drops in the ocean. There are waves in the ocean, but that those waves have no individual existence, identity. They are all part of the ocean. The individuality is an illusion. So this idea of Brahma, one universal collective consciousness, has profound implications. This is my last major point, so if you are waiting for tea, uh, just bear with me for a few more minutes. Christian marriage presupposes a particular metaphysics. And that is that I am male, I am finite, I am not female. I need my wife to be complete. So Christian uh, marriage presupposes my finiteness. I am male, I am not female, so I need my wife to be complete. It's not good for man to be alone even if marriage is hard. <laughs> Suppose this Christian worldview that I'm finite, I'm male, I'm not female, is wrong. I'm actually infinite. I'm God. I'm Brahma. Then marriage is a hindrance to my enlightenment. That's why every Hindu, every Buddhist who wants to be enlightened has to renounce marriage. Mahatma Gandhi renounced his wife when he was in South Africa because he was seeking enlightenment. 
So every Hindu, every Buddhist, Buddha himself renounced his wife and his son when he was seeking enlightenment. Because to remain married is to affirm your finiteness. But to seeking moksha, nirvana, salvation is to want to experience your infinity, that you are one with everything. So uh, that raises a question. It brings us back to the subject. I experience myself as a male, my wife as a female. What is maleness? What is femaleness? Now imagine for a moment that all the liberal theologians and many American evangelical theologians are right that Genesis 1 to 11 is stories. It's not history, it is stories. There are every Christian evangelical university in America, practically every one including Wheaton, has people who believe, has theologians, experts who believe that Genesis 1 to 11 is stories, not history. If, is it a story that God created man in his image, male and female? That's what you said. God created man in his image, male and female. Is that history or is that a story? Imagine it's a story. Then you want scientific truth. And you raise a question, what exactly then is maleness and femaleness? Hindu metaphysics, which Buddhism, Buddhism accepted, uh, and it may have pre-existed Hinduism in India, uh, called Tantra. You've heard the word Tantra. Tantric idea, uh, view of what is a human being, what is man, is very different than the biblical view. Tantric view, which is then both in Hinduism and Buddhism, is that because you are complete, you're not female, you're not male, Maleness and femaleness is in every one of us, and this is what Carl Jung is learning. In every man, at the base of the spine, there is a psychic energy called kundalini. Like serpent, when it is sleeping, it is coiled up. That's how kundalini energy is always dormant. It's fem female energy. But it is there in every man. It is coiled up. It is dormant. Through meditation, yoga, particularly sexual meditation, which Mahatma Gandhi was practicing, you have to awaken your dormant female energy. When you awaken, there are seven chakras, seven psychic centers in human spine from the brain to the bottom. And this serpent, kundalini energy is called serpent energy, female energy, shakti. When it is awakened, it begins to rise up and goes through five chakras. And after, as it passes each chakra, the meditator has fantastic psychedelic, psychological, mind-blowing, mystical experiences. Ultimately, this... Uh, kundalini power, kundalini serpent power merges with the male energy which is the crown chakra, Shiva chakra. So you have Shakti and Shiva, female and male. Both are within you because you are infinite. And you have to awaken your feminine energy to merge with your masculine male energy, Shakti and Shiva merging into each other, that's when you become infinite. You realize you're God, you're Brahma, you're complete. You're both male and female. And beyond that, because the, this dualism of male and female is an evil, is delusion. It's your brain which imposes these categories of male and female, uh, right and wrong, good and evil. World is not so divided because the world is one. There's only one God. God is everything. Everything is God. So this 
division, dualism of good and evil, male and female, right and wrong. This is all deception. This is the heart of tantric thought, both in Hinduism and Buddhism, which came to the West actually first with Swami Vivekananda in Chicago in 1893 in the first parliament of world religions. Uh, but he was very discreet, so he didn't talk very much about it in public. He was a tantric um, in a, who had had a homosexual relationship with his own guru. Um, because once you are arousing your feminine energy, you want to experience being a woman, being a female, in a sexual relationship. And uh, then, but in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, when the West, particularly America, but all of Europe, had a lot more opened up to these ideas, because Carl Jung, when he brought these ideas, he gave them, Shiv, not Hindu, Buddhist name, Shiva, Shakti, etc. He gave them scientific sounding names, anima and animus. All human beings have both female and male energies, which then the uh, 20th century, towards the end of the 20th century, the confused scientists began to say, yes, of course, we have male and female have chromosomes. Uh, every baby has same X and Y chromosomes, and as the baby begins to develop, uh, it could go either towards maleness or towards uh, femaleness uh, predominating. So uh, Jung begins that idea of everyone has male and female energy within him. You can use the word chromosomes, and you can use the terminology of X and Y, etc. And uh, you have a whole new worldview being built, which sounds scientific, because it's using the language of chromosomes and it's using the language of evolution. Um, but basically what it is doing is justifying tantric metaphysics, physiology. What is a man? Man is part of the universal self with male and female energies, both in every individual. All you need to do to Roxy is to take the masculine chip out and put in a female chip or put a, ki a cat chip, and then you will have a cat woman or a male with female organs, female body. Now, this is a massive philosophical confusion. At the root of it is the simple fact that you cannot prove that you exist as a spiritual permanent entity, as an immortal soul. Uh, this is revealed. This is a revealed truth. So if whole of Western philosophy has failed to prove that you exist, as a precious individual, permanent individual, so special that God would come to this earth and shed his blood for your salvation so that you may live immortally with him. This whole worldview is what the devil is out to destroy. So these little policy debates on which textbook will be used and what course will be used to educate children uh, and students is just a very small part of Satan's grand narrative that you are actually God. You are not a finite male or a finite female. You are God. You are one with everything. You need to realize your own divinity. Don't allow your culture, your language, your parents and your doctors to define who you are. You must say, I'm God, I'm going to define who I am, create myself. So, this is quarter to six, so the tea must be cold. So, so why don't we stop there, and if you are energized by tea, let's come back and pursue this a little more. Thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, the tea is actually ready, but it's not cooling. So I'm suggesting that uh, Dr. Lawrence will prefer our tea. 
And then for the online viewers, we'll get back to us shortly. Thank you. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for what we've heard. Drive it into our hearts and minds with understanding. Help us by your spirit to elaborate that we all might grasp the truth that you're teaching us today. Thank you that we can trust that you exist, that you have created, that you have made us who we are, and that we are what we are, and only you have shown us that. We uh, see that very clearly now. Now, because we are human beings and need nourishment from the fruit of the earth, we ask you to bless this which is before us, to strengthen us with it, and to give us grace through that strength to serve you for the rest of the evening. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Enjoy your day.
five, four, three. Yeah. Is it? Okay, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Sorry for the delay. I was informed that the camera wasn't on yet, and that's the most important eye, apparently, right now, is the camera. Uh, thank you for those that have returned to your seats. Please continue to enjoy your tea as you prepare some questions. I just want to moderate. We typically have much more free-flowing, so I think it will probably go that way. Uh, first of all, thank you again, Vishal, for introducing this level of thinking to us. Uh, this is not foreign to our interest, but it's, we don't often begin at this level with some of the policy questions that are presented to us. And to my mind, you've helped us already begin to uh, tackle some of the things that bewilder us, such as where do these things come from? How would anyone begin to think this way? And in a place like Uganda, the, it's ridiculous to many the idea that a man would want to be a woman and a woman would be a man. And you've helped us see that as ways of thinking change and are even imposed or forced, then they come upon us. And before we know it, we're, we're thinking that way. I wonder if I might trouble you just to repeat uh, two or three terms that you used that some might not be familiar with and simply give us maybe a brief uh, definition that will help the discussion. Uh, and there were two or three that came to mind. One was metaphysics or metaphysical. Uh, the other was uh, postmodern. Uh, and then along with that might be enlightenment. And then a third might be worldview. Just state your definition of that. I think everyone here is familiar with the term worldview, and it's used quite a bit, but often people will say, well, what do, we, what do they really mean when they say worldview, Christian worldview? So maybe start with those three, and then we'll open the floor to specific questions. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you. Oh, you have. I apologize for using those terms. Um, but because it is being recorded, you can listen to it second time, third time, and deal with some of the concepts which may be new for you. But let's begin with metaphysics. I began by saying that the court and the NHS, National Health Service in England, overruled the doctor's statement that uh, I'm a Christian, I believe God created us male and female, therefore I have to live according to my conscience, and I cannot call a bearded man a madam. Now what is conscience? You are a medical doctor in England, you have all the best machinery there, you took take all the x-rays, all the ultrasound, all the MRIs, and all the scans, including CAT scan. Where do you think you will find conscience? In the head, or in the heart, or in the pancreas, or lungs? Where is conscience? So you'll find a gland called conscience? It <laughs> there. Sorry? That's why it's occupies, that's why it sits in the head. Because, uh, the, which part of head has conscience? Uh, the same part that emotions are. And which is that part? Any science students here? Well, unfortunately, the health, sorry, the health services have been looking at human body, every part of human body, and they haven't found anything called conscience. There is no organ in human body called conscience. Therefore, no atheist country in history has ever respected conscience or given the freedom of conscience to citizens. Conscience is part of biblical metaphysics, that is, biblical view of who is a human being. Human being made in God's image. So Roxy can actually sleep with six guys and sh her conscience wouldn't bother her. Because she doesn't have a... It's not part of... It, conscience is not a physical organ. It is an aspect of human soul made in God's image. Now, what this tells you about the policy is 
conscience is part of the Bible. So first and second Timothy particularly talk about the necessity of keeping our conscience clean, pure, etc. What is conscience? Now, it came as a big force in European history when Martin Luther said to the emperor, to the pope, to the church, to the university that I'm sorry, I'm not going to recant anything that I have written. I know you can kill me, but please do go ahead. My conscience is captive to the word of God. What my book is expressing is what my conscience says. Now, should the state respect the conscience? Only if the state believes that you are actually made in God's image. So it took 100 years, 1521 was the Diet of Worms, Worms is a city, the Diet is a council, uh, council, the council, the emperor was present where Luther made his declaration. From that it took 100 years, 120 years. Only in 1640, through Westminster Confession, conscience became a part of Western political philosophy. So Westminster Confession uh, has a whole chapter, chapter 20, on conscience. That the government must respect the conscience of every citizen because, this is a public, public policy, because citizen is not a possession of the state. State doesn't own the citizen. State exists to serve the citizen. A citizen is a property of his creator. This was whole policy debate which is civilizing Europe. But it is based upon the assumption that a human being is made in God's image. He has a faculty called conscience. Conscience is not a physical organ. Therefore, atheists don't believe in conscience. There is no free press in uh, North Korea or Venezuela or China, any uh, atheist uh, countries. But now England, which brought the idea of conscience, which is part of Christian metaphysics, that is theory of being. Who's a human being? Uh, if this, co uh, the, this uh, verdict is being appealed, but supposing the Supreme Court decides against the doctor, then uh, that's the end of Christian England that England is no longer, its policies are not shaped by biblical worldview, which believes in conscience. So what is metaphysics? Metaphysics is the theory of being. So what we are discussing, whether you are a person, a soul, a self, that's metaphysics. Uh, the second word was? Uh, Postmodern. Postmodern. So modern, uh, modern age began with um, Martin Luther and the Reformations. Before that, there was medieval Europe. In Europe, there was medieval Europe. There was ancient Europe, the Greco-Roman world, barbarian world, which had no Christian influence. And then came the Middle Ages, which Europe did become Christian, but not biblical. Very much like Uganda. The Uganda is Christian, but not yet biblical because you aren't really studying the Bible as a worldview and applying it to your public policies, private life and public policy. Most of the Bible study is for your private devotional life. It's not about shaping your nation's policies. Uh, that's what Europe was. Those are called dark ages. But as the Bible became an open book, uh, that began to uh, end the Middle Ages and begin the modern world of freedom, including individual freedom, free press, economic development, free market economy, uh, democracy, etc. All of that came. Now, once the Enlightenment picked up momentum, Enlightenment was an intellectual movement which began as a Christian movement. Most of the early Enlightenment people, particularly in Scotland, they were Christian. Some of them 
And what they did was, uh, the Bible opened the Western mind. But then some people decided that we are not going to believe the Bible, we are going to believe our minds. So the emphasis shifted. Uh, the St. Augustine, 1500 years ago, and people like uh, Martin Luther and all are Augustinian monks. St. Augustine has taught that the difference between an animal and a human being is that human being is made in God's image. What is the image of God? Mind. Mind is the supreme gift of God to us. That's what makes us different. So to be godly means to cultivate your mind. If you are going to be in, become an innovator, a creator, you have to cultivate your mind. So Augustine wrote the curriculum of education which was taught for a thousand years in Europe. It was Augustinian monasteries that grew into universities. So Oxford, Cambridge, these were Augustinian monasteries. Martin Luther is an Augustinian monk. They are developing their mind. Not all the uh, European monasteries are becoming universities, but those that are cultivating the mind, they become the universities. But then the universities are taken over by the devil, by the mistake of the uh, philosophical mistakes the church made. So they, they took the modern world which the Bible began and made it into modernism which said we are going to believe only the human mind, not God's revelation. So modernism was the last phase of modern age where they accepted biblical values, the fruit of biblical Christianity, without the roots. Yes, all human beings are equal. How do you know? Oh, this is self-evident. This is derived from our common sense. So this became modernism. Yes, the Bible taught equality. That is what the priesthood of all believers meant. But uh, we cut it away from the Bible. We take the fruit, not the roots, not the biblical worldview, not the faith. And then all those roots are drying up. So now you have a postmodern world which is rejecting the biblical ideas. So the fruit is dead. The human rights. This was a Bible's idea. You cut it away from Bible, the child that is born has no right because he doesn't have any soul. So if the parents decide to cut up the child's body, abort it, sell the baby parts. This is postmodern because now you're giving up the notion that the child is a, a human being made in God's image, precious, valuable. We exist to serve that child, not to sell that child. So postmodernism is now a philosophical movement with overt uh, policies and practices uh, which are uh, destroying the world that the Bible had created. So why should a man have only one wife? You're happy with one wife, good for you. I need four. Why can't I have four? I'm not taking any of yours. Uh, and well, sometimes I'm attracted to women, sometimes I'm attracted to men. Why do I have to marry only one man and only one woman? Why can't I marry both a man and a woman? And why does it have to be just the three of us? So everything has to change because the idea that one man should have only one wife, this is not an African idea, this is not an Indian idea. This is the Bible's idea, rooted in the fact that God made one Eve for one Adam. He didn't make 70 whores in paradise. And he didn't make four women, he made one Eve. Through sin, through corruption, yes, the Old Testament allowed polygamy that a brother should take his brother's widow, uh, provide insurance to her, have children through her so that she can inherit 
her husband's property when her children can cultivate etc but that was not ideal that was adjustment to a fallen world the ideal was that a mature christian should have only one wife this was the bible's idea and this is a part of the policy of family sexuality which the bible shaped the modern world but the postmodern world that sex should be limited to in marriage to one man one woman in a permanent lifelong exclusive relationship that those ideas are gone they're dead they're not yet being expressed in policies but the time is coming many of the european countries has already allowed muslim men to have more than one wife and uh, but why should it be limited to only Muslims? Why can't Christians have many wives? Why do I have to give up my faith to have many wives? Uh, those policies will come up and will have to change. And why does a man have to marry only a woman? Why can't he marry both a man and a woman? These are policy issues, but they're rooted in certain assumptions. And postmodernism is rebuilding a world on intellectual confusion and therefore moral and social confusion. And the third word was? Worldview. Worldview. Uh, the Bible gives a view of the world, even if your pastors don't. You're, uh, we have a major problem that a son who cannot become a lawyer, who cannot become a businessman, you send him to the theological seminary. <laughs> then he is not interested in any policy discussion. Although we are showing today that all these policies have theological foundations. But our preachers are not studying the Bible as a view of life, view of reality, view of life, which should inform. We pray God's will should be done on us as it is done in heaven. But are we going to invent what his will is or are we going to learn what his will is from his word? That's a worldview. What is God's will about what marriage should be, what family should be, what divorce should be, what uh, medicine should be, and what education should be? This is applying worldview to life so that our nations do what God desires. That's a worldview. So, uh, studying the Bible worldviewishly is the number one necessity. And this has been greatly damaged. A lot of the damage in our case came from America. The InterVarsity Press had searched the scriptures on which I was mentored. Uh, that you have a quiet time and you read a passage of the Bible, search the scripture, gave you a plan, three-year plan on how to go through the whole Bible. But one day you're reading here, evening you're reading there, morning you're reading, reading here, e evening you're reading there. You never read the Bible as a whole, as a book to shape your worldview. You read the Bible only to shape your personal devotional Christian life. And so this problem uh, that American Christianity uh, had lost vision of the Bible as a God's revelation that gives us a view of reality, view of life. That is a worldview, and that is what has got to be recovered. We have, we have to read Bible every day systematically to see its worldview and then apply it to everything. Thank you. That's very thorough, very good. All of you who are out there teaching foundations, I think you're taking very good notes, right? Or want to show this <laughs> uh, in your course. A number of these are instructors in those foundations courses, and these are, this is a very, very clear <laughs> depiction. Now, in this country and all across Africa, all of these issues are being debated. Uh, marriage and divorce bill reform is on the table. Uh, uh, proposals to liberalize abortion are on the table. Comprehensive sex education is on the table. Uh, laws of inheritance, which get to this. Who can actually inherit property and whether equally or not? 
uh, polygamy is very live in this culture. Uh, for some reason, East Africa has held the line against homosexuality, and for what reason? The discernment seems to be that it's more a level of disgust than real grasp of metaphysics, but that's to be um, considered. But I know there's a lot of questions for you here, and maybe some who have specific policy issues or concerns that they'd like to take up in this framework. So let me turn it over. I'd like to see hands. Who would like to uh, begin some discussion? Jonathan Tim Webzy, one of our instructors. He also works with the Institute for Faith, Learning, and Studies that we were telling you about. He'll be hosting you tomorrow, I believe. Should he have the mic? Yes. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Larry, Larry and APC. Thank you, Professor Vishal. It's, it's really an honor for me to listen to you uh, for the second time. We were together last year at a um, uh, conference that you were um, talking very deeply about uh, the role of the church in politics. So um, mine is a deep, really deep question um, about all this. I like the way you think and express your thoughts. I follow you on YouTube, I listen to you, I read your books. So your thoughts are, um, are fresh of breath air for me. I really like how you engage um, with the Christian faith. Um, here is my whole mess of my thoughts and my questions. I hope you are able to sieve them out at the end of the day. Um, in terms of the philosophical contribution and how we are grappling with the deep philosophical questions, I, I feel that's a place that as Christians we need to engage with and find our place and relevance amidst all this. So speaking from the Western philosophical perspective, you make um, a lot of impression and you push me very deeply to think about the forces in the academic realm that have really shaped my thinking and all that. Um, I remember in my classes at my graduate level, we had deep conversations about Marxism, capitalism, and all these different forces. Um, and, but what was really bothering me is that I was not finding my place in terms of what is the African philosophical contribution to these kinds of things that are happening. Um, you talk very um, strongly about you know, the, the, the forces coming from the uh, Britain, uh, US, China, the Indian uh, worldview, but what I'm trying to grapple with is that as all these forces are coming towards Africa, what is our place in terms of our intellectual uh, positioning as Africans and how we're thinking about these kinds of, uh, of thoughts? And how do we position ourselves amid this, amid this of this and how can we uh, best respond in this? Do we have uh, even just questioning the whole African um, concept? What is Africa? What is African? What is African ideology? And how do we respond to these uh, concepts? But also having um, a biblical foundation to how we're seeing God manifest in our African paradigms or African uh, lines of thought so that we can be, uh, have a strategic influence or a rather unique line of thought that we can contribute uh, to this. I don't know whether you can give a comment to that or, um, but anyways, I hope you can say something to that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in, uh, uh, some, some of the things I've said today are in this book, in the fourth chapter, and the philosophical ideas that are uh, modernism and everything that began from Descartes is dead and now the lostness, confusion, darkness has come and that it's not just soul that is dead, logic is dead. Um, uh, without logos, logic doesn't make any sense. Language is dead. Um, in the, uh, died with uh, 100 years ago with Wittgenstein linguistic analysis in Cambridge philosophy. So that's fourth chapter, what is language, what is logic, what is soul, and those are the issues underlying the question of abortion, question of gender confusion, uh, which the, the Western church has collapsed. There was not a tsunami, just a mild storm of uh, homosexuality, gay, lesbian movement, and. Uh, American church had no intellectual leadership which could resist uh, that uh, storm coming because none, the seminaries are not teaching any of this, the, the theologians. Uh, and so American Christian leadership was totally unprepared to respond to the, let's call it tsunami for now, uh, tsunami of homosexuality. So uh, uh, now about Africa, 
there is a chapter here called Bloodshed for Tolerance. How did the West become tolerant? And the chapter is arguing that the tolerance went to Europe from Africa. It was Tertullian, Lactentius, I can't pronounce him, Oregon, uh, Augustine. Uh, uh, the, uh, it was African intellectuals before North uh, uh, Africa was colonized by Islam, uh, African theologians, intellectuals, who taught tolerance. So Emperor Constantine actually hired Lactentius, who was an African theologian, to read his own books to the emperor, which opened the emperor to the idea that the state should be uh, tolerant towards Christians. And the church was legalized, Christianity was legalized, and then later made exclusive religion. But uh, Europe becoming tolerance is a massive contribution that African intellectuals made to Europe. Uh, that chapter is here. So uh, instead of going more into detail, uh, I would answer your question that Africa has already contributed some of the most important things to the West. Uh, we lost it along the way. It's now your job to recover and instead of just receiving from the West or the East, you become to give, you begin to give the light. Uh, so uh, just read the first 10, 15 pages of that uh, chapter on bloodshed for martyrdom to help you uh, recover the African self-esteem, uh, the intellectual strength of the African church. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Don't fail to introduce yourself, please. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor. I'm called Eliabu Ichiriza, and uh, also I teach here. Uh, my question also is in line with Jonathan's. Uh, what can make us think that the church or Christianity is the best force against Western ideas of socialism? Because over years, we have seen the church being more influenced by society than the opposite. In fact, in Africa, we see the church is the medium of Western culture, uh, through uh, singing and worship style, language. The church is at the forefront of bringing the Western cultures. Why can't we think of our African cultures and traditions to be the best wall against sexualism and Western forces. For example, Uganda's position against homosexuality, I don't think it is, well, it is inspired by Christianity, but not really grounded by Christian, uh, in Christianity. So why can't we think of uh, reintegrating uh, African uh, ethnic even beliefs uh, as a force against the wave of Western uh, uh, socialism. Yeah. Well, um, the simple truth is that the West is lost and confused now. It was the most powerful civilization for the last five, six hundred years, seven hundred years. And those who followed Christ, the Americans, Europeans, they came here and they blessed us. They blessed Uganda. Uh, but right now, Christianity has, is at a very low ebb. Some of the best, uh, strongest, largest churches in Europe are African churches, led by Africans. So uh, you are already um, producing Christian leaders who are going, whether to Kiev or to London or to any of these countries, and building up the largest churches. There is no reason why you cannot also be producing the thinkers who will speak into the confusion and the lostness of Western 
philosophy, theology, science, and sociology, and history, and you will give guidance and light. So there's no reason why the new reformation cannot begin here in Uganda. Can I jump in and tease this out a bit? Because I know at least these two and some others here can help with this dialogue. So let's take the question that he raised earlier, that clearly, biblically, the concept of conscience is there. So what do you as an African say to that notion? Where do we go to explore uh, and perhaps find within your experience, your culture, a notion of conscience? Does, does that exist? Uh, and can we tease that out? Can we perhaps develop that as Africans? And uh, you might want to go in the direction of what you often describe as Ubuntu or, or uh, collective uh, commitments that help shape and form individuals. I, th I think one aspect in the West is that it's a very individualistic notion. And what happened over time was freedom of conscience became autonomy and became the right to choose based on whatever I perceive versus participation in something larger, which I believe would be a more biblical notion of conscience. I don't know, Elia or Jonathan, or, yeah, uh, Professor uh, Martin Chizito uh, would like to address this particular one. Yes, yeah, take this one. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. My name is Martin Chizito. I have followed the presentation very well. It's very touching, very inspiring, and really worth reflecting on for quite a long time. I think I'll keep reflecting on many of the things that you have said. But just to try to respond uh, to the issue in, you know, at hand, the African response to this kind of what is going on, as we have had. I think right from the beginning, the Africans realized that an individual is extremely weak. And this idea of culture and the social construction of who an individual is was probably aimed at creating a powerful force that can protect this individual in society where he belongs. So they try to create what they think is socially acceptable and probably defend and protect this weak individual who cannot single-handedly uh, make maximum use of what we call the conscious now against the forces that are encountering that individual. And I'm saying that because it also touches one of the statements that you made, which have been, con which have continued to reflect on as the presentation went on. And it said, as man, you are born with everything, right? And you can create yourself and not allow society or culture to define you. And I was trying to reflect, <coughs> when we have been facing this powerful force of lesbianism and homosexuality from the West, what has actually helped us stand and attempt to resist it has been two things. One has been the culture. This is outside our cultural context. Two has been the Christianity. And this is what has collectively held us together as a fiber in Uganda to say no against some of these practices. Concluding on that, I have also been looking at our audience here. And I've been thinking, we've had all this. And at the end of the day, it comes to an individual to make a decision. But the forces behind these gender policies are overwhelmingly powerful. They are driving policies that come from the global West, 
driven through the right, rights-based approach to development. You have a right to this. You have a right to that. Everything has zeroed down on rights. And all these other agents that promote this kind of this philosophy or this world view, of course, through globalization, we see a number of these uh, civil society, international civil society organizations coming down here. We see our own governments taking on some of these policies, of course, from the global world. We know through the conditions eh, for getting donor funding and they're taken on. And we see, of course, other agents, including the church itself. Because today what we seem to see is that actually, I think it has been a historical kind of, um, you know, that the church and the state have tended to work together. And the church, even here in Africa, has always tried to be very careful not to antagonize the state because of how the state has been known to be mighty in Africa that it can crush everything. So I've been thinking, thinking in this audience, how can we face and engage all these mighty forces that are really trying to promote this kind of philosophy that we are looking at today? Thank you. Jordan and then Reverend. Um, hi, everyone. I'm called to a CMA, Jordan McGurin. I work for Africa Policy Center, Uganda Partners, and the Center for Global Engagement. So I first have a few comments, and I have one question. Um, first comment, I'm wondering, Ethiopians, <laughs> the Ethiopian Tohedo Church, they have indigenous philosophy that you might call African. If you in think Ethiopians are African, of course, depending on how we define what Africa is, you get. Also, Ethiopians are a Christian group that are non, they don't, they didn't bring Western Christianity. Just because Ugandan Christianity is mostly Western, you got it from colonialists, you get. Huh? Christianity on the continent in Ethiopia was not uh, colonialist, which it might, be the, it might be unique. Of course, Ethiopia was not colonized as well. So Ethiopians are one place to consider about what African Christian, Christianity looks like when it's not colonialist. And also, they have a long tradition of intellectual formation as indigenous African peoples, especially in the monasteries. Um, another question, another comment. I'm, I'm confused, this idea that, Af or maybe we say African or Ugandan cultures, that they're a bulwark or a defense against homosexuality. Because in fact, if you look at the literature, even in Uganda, especially, I know most among the Baganda, homosexu homosexuality existed, you know? Men were having sex with other men, and sometimes, some, maybe women too, but men, seemingly from the record, we know that it happened among men. Usually it's more quiet about women than men are, when are more, in the record, people know more about them. So that's what I just wonder. I think the opposition is mostly from Christianity. That's my opinion. But I think Uganda needs to wrestle with, um, in indigenous, some of the cult indigenous cultures in Uganda, homosexuality was there, you get. So now what do we do in this contemporary time as Christians if we want to both draw on being indigenous and being Christian but not being Western? Like how do we put them all together? Anyways, my question for you, there's some cultures in the world, especially some in India that are known and some in native North America and also some in South America that um, people that we, might, that we might call now transgender, that, the, that we might use that word, those people existed in the context, some people like that, usually as a certain group. Huh? Sometimes a third gender, sometimes whatever, however they might call themselves, usually they had their own categories. Seemingly they had, they fit somehow in the society, and seemingly they had an okay life, you know, a life similar to other people. So if that's the case, what do we do as Christians who usually do want people's dignity to be respected, we want people to have seemingly a good life somehow, but when there were societies before Christianity came, that usually had such people, and they, had, they were okay, they had their good life. But then sometimes, when Christianity did came through mission, missionary, missionaries or colonialism or whatever, sometimes these people, at least they say they experienced violence, huh? Because they were transgender or whatever, whatever term they may call themselves. They have a good life, but then Christianity comes and they were experiencing violence for some reason. So what do we do when societies had these people 
they were okay, life was okay, but then as Christians, what do we, how do we talk about them? Or how do we talk about that experience? What should they do? Should they change? Should they continue in the way they're living? That's my question. You want to take one more and then address? Yeah. <clears throat> I found him out there and brought him in. <laughs> ready for here because I wasn't aware. I also thank you for the invitation. I Reverend, yes. please tell us your name. Oh, I am Reverend Rick Sam Eichert from the Dark of Lano. I have a motivation from your presentation. The two individuals whom you gave their cases, one the doctor and the other person who was asked to present a budget, the other lady. Okay. If I try to relate their operations within the policy, they did not sit to formulate the policies. They were working within the formulated policies, but they chose to do it differently. That means at this stage, we who are gathered here, who have been challenged by this presentation, are operating within policies that have already been set by those whose intentions were hidden. It begins with me, who is here. How am I going to operate within that policy settings? What difference am I going to pull out <coughs> before I have an opportunity, if I may, to sit in the formulation process of a policy. And remember, in the process of formulation of a policy, I may be the only one whose intention is clear against 100 or 1,000. So, operating within a policy with a difference is my choice, number one, because I may not have time to sit in the formulation. Question. Okay, maybe um, uh, another encouragement. When we talk about church, what is the church doing? We are at Uganda Christian University Mukono, which is a harm of the church. As a student, as a professor, as a staff, am I forgetting that I am church? I am I'm operating in the church. So what am I doing? Before I, or if I talk about church, whom am I looking at? Is it the archbishop? Is it who? Let it start with me before we see the picture that is bigger than I can reach. So what can we do? In this case, Uganda Christian University Mukono, to have this kind of information reach other people. I have sat here only once. I may have no opportunity to sit. Many of the things are coming so new and yet challenging. How can I have opportunity to better my understanding in this matter so that I can go out and make a good representation? Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> thank you for those very helpful comments and questions. Um, the two about individual individualism, which you also had a comment. Well, let me begin with a short answer to your question. Um, uh, Jesus acknowledges that some people are uh, born eunuchs, some are made eunuchs by the society, and uh, some have chosen to be eunuchs for the kingdom of God. So what do we do with, in India, with uh, the eunuchs community. Most of India, actually Hindu India, Muslim India, despises them. But our university, our vice chancellor, uh, he made a policy a long time ago that on Christmas, they go as a group, the eunuchs dancing, collecting money. The, the baby is born or marriage is happening, they go there. So he would always invite them into his home offer them Christmas cake, tea, coffee, talk to them as human beings, and uh, respect them. 
and this is important for, uh, that we cultivate that respect for every human being. Now, do we uh, say that if someone is born with a gender confusion, that is normal? Well, I'm born with a diabetic genes, inherited it from my father, possibly also from my mother's side. I have to accept that I'm diabetic. Uh, that's how I'm born. Everybody is born with some deformity in the fallen world. But do I really want my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to receive the same deformity? Or should I support a research that makes sure that with a generation these uh, deformed genes are not passed on? So to say that I receive deformed genes from my parents isn't meant to insult them or insult me. Um, but this is not what God created diabetic genes, whatever, whatever appropriate word is. So can it be changed? Should it be changed? Or yes, so God created men in his image, male and female. Some are born confused because of whatever reason. And uh, we must respect them, love them, honor them. But it doesn't mean that God didn't create man, male and female and that abnormality should be accepted as normal. If anyone born with abnormality should be respected. But uh, we don't have to be confused that this is all evolutionary accident. But the important issue is the individual. See, all the reformations in Europe began with individuals in a university. So Wycliffe was in Oxford, uh, Jean Hus was in Prague, universities. Luther was in Wittenberg University. So the university provided the intellectual the support environment. And I was saying this afternoon that uh, once uh, Pope was rejected, Pope had two functions. He was the infallible voice of God Pope in council, and he was the executive head of the church over the bishops and universities, everything else. Lutheranism split the two roles. In many of the German states where there was a nobility ruling, the prince became the head of the German church. But there were many cities uh, such as um, Geneva or Bern or Basel, which were republican cities, the cities were republic. There the city chose its own leadership. So in some places bishops were the head of the city, or monasteries, abbeys were running the cities. And so there were different arrangements, but generally the majority of the Lutheran cities, uh, Lutheran states, provinces, kingdoms. The prince became the executive head of the church, figurehead. He appointed the bishops, etc. He oversaw. But the infallible voice of the God, Lord, which was no longer infallible, university became the voice of, the Protestant university became the voice of the voice of God. Because the professors were able to hold each other accountable, each other's interpretation of the Bible accountable. Luther's translation was carefully investigated by other scholars. Who, he, he didn't know Greek. He learned Greek from, from his junior uh, professor, Philip Melanchthon, and then he taught himself Hebrew because there was no Hebrew teacher in the University of Wittenberg. So uh, university became the voice of God, what popes used to do, what is truth, what does the Bible teach on this issue. So this policy institute is very important 
because what you're doing is learning how to apply God's truth to a particular issue. Now, your voice will not necessarily be heard tomorrow by the state, but you're learning to become those who will shape Uganda's future policies. <coughs> but the significance of an individual, it was 1851, 1841, when individualism began to be secularized and created today's problem. So individualism is one of the Bible's greatest gifts to Western civilization. Science grows when an individual says, my professors are wrong. All the university's professors are wrong. This is the truth. Then everybody hates him, denies funding to him. But eventually, if he stands his ground and proves that he is actually right, then everybody begins to support him and gives him Nobel Prize, etc. So uh, confidence uh, in the individual, that's what Luther is doing. So Luke, Martin Luther, the father of uh, your pioneer of uh, Protestant Reformation, is an individualist. Um, that I'm not going to accept what the popes have said, what the church council have said, what the emperor has said, because my conscience is captive to the word of God. That begins theological and philosophical and sociological, political uh, revolutions when an ind individual is committed to uh, live under God. And why is he an individual? Because Paul is an individualist. Paul says, I'm dead to the world, the world is dead to me. Jesus is an individualist. Abraham is an individualist. God calls a person, you forget your father's land, forget your culture, you walk with me. But you walk with me, I will take you to heaven. That's not what God says. God says, you walk with me, follow me. I will make you a great nation because through you I want to bless all the nations. So, biblical individualism is opposite of secularized individualism. So what secularism, modern age becoming modernism, what it did was it took all the biblical ideas cut them from God's revelation and the Bible, secularized them, corrupted them. So how secularized individualism was born was in 1841, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a transcendentalist philosopher, a young man, gave a series of lectures. His, he loved his wife. She was 19 when she died of tuberculosis. And he, as he saw her dying, he was really shaken up and began to think deeply, profusely, uh, sharply about life and reality. Then he gave a series of lectures in the Masonic Lodge. They were published. His lecture on individualism was published as self-reliance. For more than 100 years, the lecture was quoted left, right, and center, part of American literature. Because it is a brilliant lecture. He, his models of individualism are Moses, Plato, and Paul. Milton, John Milton, these are models. But he goes so far as to say that you shouldn't worship in the church because then you will begin to think and talk like your pastor and elders. You should be silent, listen to your own inner voice, then you will be a true individualist. So what happens with this individualism which is taken from the Bible, modern age becoming modernist, modernism, which has ended into postmodernism. Post uh, but the difference was, in Christ, individualism was an individual dedicating himself to God, surrendering himself to God in such a radical way that you take my life, cut my body, shed my blood so that others might have life. I dedicate myself to God for my body to be broken, for my blood to be shed, to bless the world. I don't live for myself, I live for God. I surrender myself to God so that he might take me and he might bless the world through me. That's biblical individualism. Secularized individualism is opposite that, oh, my girlfriend got pregnant, or my wife got pregnant, 
and I don't want the inconvenience of having this baby. I would rather kill this baby because this relationship with, I have with my girlfriend or my wife is for me, for my advantage, not to give me inconvenience. So I make no sacrifices for anyone. I sacrifice my children for myself. So, everything exists for me. I'm the center of my universe. Jesus came for me, didn't he? Uh, church exists for me. If this church music is boring or the pastor is boring or I don't like one of the elders, I quit. Everything is for me. These relationships are for me. Now, we'll, I'll, we'll pursue this on Wednesday when we talk about parenting and family a bit. I, as an individual, I'm God's image. But I become more of God's image when I choose to love my wife and become one with her. When two of us become three, have a baby, that's when I become more of God's image. Because when God is making man in his image, he's making male and female, for two of them to be one flesh, to become three. So the idea that I as an individual am God's image is only half truth, and it actually becomes corruption of biblical Christianity. Um, because family is God's image, because he's triune. When, how, how does it make me God's image? Two o'clock in the morning, my wife says, you get up and change the diaper. Because she's already fed the baby twice. I haven't heard the baby crying. I'm fast asleep. But when I choose to obey my wife, get up and change the diaper, then I understand the father heart of God, the mother heart of God. You know, I become more like God, sacrificing myself, my sleep, my comfort for my wife, for my baby. So this idea of God as an individualist is a Unitarian idea. God is a trinity. He makes man in his image, male and female, for them to have children, because only through the family, through parenting, as we will discuss on Wednesday, we establish our dominion over this earth. So yes, polygamy is a problem in Africa, but that is why Africa has not produced rulers who will establish their dominion over Africa, because it is family through which Human beings establish their sovereignty over this earth. But we'll continue that. Thank you so much. I want to respect our time and especially the energy and time of yeah. our guest who has many more tasks ahead of him. So uh, to close, I'd like to call on our senior colleague, Professor Peter, to uh, give a word of gratitude and close in prayer, please. Thank you. I wonder whether there are still doubts. Are you still doubting? There was a word, doubt. I hope that we have been helped to think more clearly and more confidently as to who we are what we make, the team we make, of the human beings that God has made us to be, without excuse and without apology to be who we are. I was looking at um, what Paul said in Colossians 2.8. It came to my mind. Um, talking about philosophy, not being confused. Do not be dragged into empty philosophy. But if we know the Lord, we have got full dose, well-equipped philosophy to challenge this world. And I want to thank you very much. I think he deserves a round of applause again. Thank you. 
you really deepen our thoughts and you deepen our interest in liking to think now, I must confess that I tend to find that we are lazy in thinking. We do not engage, we do not question. We receive very easily without challenging. Just one more teaser. My grandchildren were playing. Oh, it is raining cats and dogs. And then I said, no, it is raining cows and goats. Say, no, Grandpa. It has always been cats and dogs. I said, no, it is cows and goats. <laughs> you see, if you do not challenge, it is just occurred to them, why did they call it cats and dogs and not cows and goats? If you do not challenge, you will not get deeper meaning of what you go through. And the Lord has given us that opportunity. So I want to thank APC for making this audience possible for us to come together and for bringing him in our midst and your willingness to come and talk and share with us the deeper knowledge of what goes on around us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, I want to thank the young man there, Clement, who has been running around. I think we have to give him a hand. Let us come here and enjoy ourselves. So thank you so much. And may God richly bless you. And may he give you more insight that you may give understanding to yet more people. And this is true knowledge. And this is wisdom. Thank you. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now I've been requested a group photo. So anyone who can participate quickly, come up here, gather around. We'll take the photo. Is that correct? Okay, I will give it to the man who has the instructions. All right. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we have yet finished because we have not said a closing prayer. So we would like to have a group photo, I think, uh, outside. Mark, would you please come so that uh, we can have a bit of fresh air, but also enjoy the sm nature smiles and we have better pictures of ourselves. So I think we would uh, just walk outside that door. We are going to take a group photograph. Thank you. Thank you. What's your name? Rule of life. It's okay. Uh,